Hey and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about a really deep and important question. That is, uh, is stress relaxation or cyclic loading better experiments when it comes to material model calibration? Which of these if, uh, should you use uh, in order to get the best material model in the end when you try to calibrate your material model? Um, so to demonstrate this and talk about this, what I want to do is I want to show you some experimental data first. So this is the data for a thermoplastic elastomer. And uh, here are some files that I have, four different files. So time, engineering strain, engineering stress in these different files. So uh, I'm going to copy these by clicking on uh, copy. I'm going to open a new window uh, of M calibration. I'm going to paste in these files right here. And it just pastes it right in from the experimental data files. And here they are. Um, uh, instead of having these long complicated names, which is really the, the names of the files, I'm going to right click on these and rename load cases based on type. So this is what the data looks like. It's kind of interesting. Um, it seem, seems to be a too monotonic tension. It's the slower and the faster. And then there are two cyclic tests. One test here in blue uh, happened to be a one hour relaxation over here. And this one contains multiple relaxation segments at different strain levels. Um, so this is the data we are to work with uh, today. Um, the first thing I want to do is to uh, show you how you can extract the relaxation segments from one of these tests. So I'm going to turn these off and see. In this case, we have one relaxation here for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. We have uh, six of them, it looks like, in this particular test. So what I want to do is going to select this one. I'm going to um, I click on this icon here, Edit Experimental Data. And uh, I'm going to show you how to extract the relaxation data from one of these six segments. So if I go to uh, Time versus Stress, you see that I'm going to pick this one here. So I'm going to start by uh, zooming in and I select the point before the first uh, peak value and I'm going to do control shift up arrow on my keyboard I click the delete key on my keyboard and I get rid of all of that and then I'm going to go to the end of this here's the first point after the end of this relaxation I control shift down arrow delete and here's the, uh, the relaxation data for that particular segment um, in order to use this in M calibration we have to make this data start from zero so I rescale, uh, shift it up like that. Then we can see that the whole uh, segment here is about 600 seconds, so it's 10 minutes long. Uh, I'm going to save this file to uh, my hard drive here. Uh, how about here? I'm going to call it relax. And there it is. If I want to use this in M calibration, I can now click on the plus sign and go to uh, stress relaxation data, which requires you to specify uh, a file, and this is the file we just created, so relax. And here it is. Time column was 1, and stress column is going to be 3 in this case. And if you don't know that, you can click on the view data file, see stress column is 3. I say it here. Now we have to also specify what was the relaxation strain and how long time did it take for the test machine to reach that strain. So. I'm just going to keep this default values here and see that this is where it's at and it's not quite right. So we're going to have to modify this. So I'll go back to this load case. I'm going to click on edit experimental data. And we'll go back and figure out this is um, about 20% strain is the one that we're looking for. So if I go to about 20% strain, so it's this one here. So we needed to know um, the strain of this relaxation. So we, so the strain, I can just click on any point in here. The strain is about 0 0.21. OK, so I'll go back. I'll click on this relaxation. And we know that the strain is 0 0.21. So we need to specify that, 0 0.21. Save this. We also specify how long time does it take for the test machine to reach that strain. Um, so we need to know the strain rate of this particular test. Uh, we know that the strain rate um, is 0 0.04 approximately. So if we um, 
we can, I guess, plot this in a different way to find out even more about the strain rate. So on the y-axis here, I'm going to plot strain rate, engineering strain rate. You see the strain rate is 0 0.04 approximately. Maybe 0 0.05 is a good strain rate. And uh, I'm going to open a little calculator here. So 0 0.21 is strain divided by 0 0.05. So it takes about 4.2 seconds for the test machine to reach that uh, value. So it's 4.2 seconds. So time to reach relaxations is 4.2 seconds. So this is one way to specify these relaxation segments in the test. So what I did was I extracted information in this segment here, and I created it into a separate uh, load case. And I can repeat this for all of these. That gives me six of them. And the question here that I want to answer today is really, is it better to use the complete curve here, or is it more uh, better for the calibration to use multiple relaxation segments like this um, for different load cases? Um, so that's what we're going to explore. So let's first simply um, open up my saved version so I don't have to repeat this procedure six times. So I'm not going to save it. I'm going to go to experimental data. And here you can see that these are the relaxation uh, segments that I extracted from the master curve or the, the main curve that was done in blue here. So that's, that's, that's the data set that I want to work with. Um, so, so how do we decide what's better here? Well, we need the material model. And what kind of material model do we want to use for this example? Um, the material model I will use is, uh, is the PolyUmod TNV model. It's one of the better material models that are available right now. It has a feature here that's really good for these kinds of thermoplastic elastomers, TPEs. So clicking on TPEs, and it sets up a, a structure for this model that is really good for this material, as you will see. And it has all these parameters here. And that's the starting point for my calibration. And I will calibrate this model now in four different ways. I'm going to calibrate it using only, in, in one case, I'm going to calibrate it using only the, the monotonic tension test. So I say, I'm going to pretend that this is all I have. I calibrate this model to this data. And then I'm going to compare it to all the data to see if it works. And that way I will do it. I will use monotonic data. And then I'm going to activate these, the relaxation segments. So this is calibration two. I have the monotonic and I have the relaxation data on top of it. So that's another combination of data that I can explore. The third one is to use the monotonic data and the, the measured data from the test machine. So these four curves is my third set of calibrations. And the fourth one is when I activate all of these all of these ones, and I calibrate the material model to this data set. So here, the point is to see which, which of these data sets or load cases is most important in order to get the good material model in the end. Uh, so that's kind of where I want to go here. Um, to, to make this quicker and easier for us, I have already performed this uh, investigation, and I'm going to show you the results. We can talk about it in a faster way. So. The goal here was to explore these four different kinds of calibration approaches, as I talked about, in calibrating the T and V model from the PolyUmod library. Um, and the difference between experimental data uh, is, uh, and, and sort of cyclic data is that you have the complete time, stress, and strain. Whereas if you have the stress relaxation data only, you have time and stress. And it's just for the relaxation portion of the test. So those are the two things we want to look at. And we, we calibrated this type of uh, TNV model. So let's look at the results. Calibration one, I have monotonic data. This is the starting point. So I'm using M calibration for the calibration. I, in all of these cases, I use the same initial guess of the parameters. And this is what it looks like. It's not a particularly great guess, but it seems like a reasonable guess. If I run this with M calibration and calibrate to this data set, this is the data I get. It looks pretty good. You see, the dashed lines are in good agreement with the solid lines. The error is 1.36%. Uh, you should also note that I stopped this calibration after about 100 function evaluations. And I just let it run for about a minute. So I stopped it very quickly. Uh, and there, there's a good reason for doing that. And, uh, and that is that this particular TNV model is a 
highly nonlinear advanced viscoplastic model. So some features, some of the parameters in this model prescribe how the model will behave during unloading, how much recovery will happen, what's the back stress, and all of these other things. And we don't have that in this data set when we calibrate it. And if I try to calibrate a model um, like that to data that doesn't have all the features, is there is a risk that some of the parameters will float because they may not influence the results. So they may float to bad values. So that's why I stopped it pretty early to make sure that they have reasonable numbers even though we really should have more data for it. And if I, so this is what it looks like. And if I then turn on in M calibration, the four main load cases that we had, and I compare the predictions that we calibrated earlier here to that, we'll see that the predictions look actually reasonably good. I was a little surprised to see how well this worked. Uh, the, the, the green and the blue were the calibrations, and these down here are the results for situations we didn't really have data for. The error was 3%, 3.06%. Not too bad, right? Only two tension tests and you get all of this. I was kind of impressed. Here's the, the stress relaxation results. The solid lines are the experimental uh, results for these uh, six different, uh, I guess there's seven actually, seven different relaxation segments. The dashed lines are the predictions from the model. And this again is very cool, isn't it? That even though we only had data for two different strain rates, when we calibrate the model, we could actually predict the stress relaxation response pretty well. I, I, it was perhaps a little bit of luck here uh, in terms of how the calibration actually worked out, but it's very interesting to see that. There are a few other things that you could look at if you're curious about uh, sort of the topic of linear viscoelasticity. It's if you look at this data here, is this a linear viscoelastic material model? If it was, the slope of these curves should be the same for each level of strain, and it's not. So therefore, this is not a linear viscoelastic material model. Uh, so that's one, one quick way to do it. They should also, if you normalize them, if you divide the initial stress uh, by the value here, then they sh um, by, by the, the strain that was applied, they should also get a constant curve for all conditions. And I didn't plot that, but that's something you can look at if you're interested in. Um, calibration two. So what, what if we now not only have the monot monotonic test, but we also activate the stress relaxation parts of these tests and we calibrate to that. Um, so here is, um, here's the initial guess in dashed lines. It's pretty far from it. I run the simulation, this calibration for a little bit. And these are the results that I get after calibration to this data and see that these vertical lines here, that's the relaxation segments, right? So it, it loads up here and then it relaxes. And uh, the error is actually quite good again, 1.29% error. It looks fabulous actually. If I take that material model now and try to <clears throat> see what happens when you do cyclic loading from the other um, uh, curves that we have, we see that it doesn't look so good. It clearly over predicts the permanent deformation, the plasticity. And the error is still very nice, 2.87%, not too bad, but one couldn't expect that this model would predict how much it recovers during unloading uh, because we didn't give it information about that. The, the calibration procedure can't capture that if you don't give it data to work with. And in this case, this particular TMV model actually has some parameters that allow you to determine how much recovery you see during unloading. And to demonstrate that, I was going to flip over to polymerfem.com here. Uh, and I just have TNV, which is the name of this material model. And um, if I click on this article here, um, you can see if you scroll down, it can see what the different parameters do here. Now, we don't need to go through this in detail, but I thought it would be interesting to uh, show this. Like this particular parameter, FSS, this shows you how the slope after unloading can be controlled uh, using that parameter. And uh, in our example here, um, clearly that's a parameter that should be uh, giving you a slightly different slope here, but we couldn't calibrate that. The software can't do that because it wasn't given that information. So that's the limitation of not having the unloading uh, response. Uh, but otherwise, look at this. Look at the relaxation curves. They look fantastic over all ranges here. Very impressive. Calibration three. So here's when we calibrate 
this TMV model from the same starting point to all of the original curves. We didn't try to extract the stress relaxation, but we used the raw, the, the, the raw curves from the test machine, basically. And the calibrations now look better in my mind. We can see that the unloading response here matches the data better. And that's simply because uh, the parameters can now be fit to that response in a more accurate way. So this is an advantage when you have that kind of data, not just simply skip that as part of your calibration or experimental testing side. Um, the relaxation curves um, look okay too. The error is 1.8%. Well, we can't really complain about that, but it, it looks, it's a little bit off. It's not as good as some of the other ones uh, that we have seen. The slope here of this green one here is a little bit off. And, uh, we calibrate this to this data, but it wasn't calibrated specifically to these. That is, when we calibrated this model to this data set, it tries to match all at once, and it may not emphasize the relaxation as much as it, it could. That's why this prediction is a little bit off. The last calibration that I want to talk about is when we use all data at once uh, that, that we talked about, and we try to calibrate to that. And this is the final results. I get an error of 1.7%. This is the best. This is the most accurate for this case. And that is not surprising, right? We, we, we use all the data that we want to predict during the calibration. That gives us the best uh, predictive model in the end, actually. Um, so here are the, the, the different figures. This is the stress relaxation and all of that. So let's summarize and look at the, the results here in the table format. We have four different ways we calibrated this. If you use monotonic loading only, the errors are great, but we, we really have sacrificed some of the accuracy that we could get by having um, relaxation data or cyclic data in the mix. So this monotonic is clearly the worst of the four ways. I would not recommend only using monotonic if you're using this particular material that can take advantage of the unloading response. Switching on a relaxation with the monotonic actually works surprisingly well. You see that the error here is, is, is very low. It's basically as good as using all data at once. So that's kind of uh, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, in this case, you don't necessarily gain that much. You gain a sum by, by having the unloading, but it's, it's not as much as one would think. But by looking at the figures, so that when you evaluate these material models by just looking at them, I certainly would prefer in my simulations to use one of the calibrations here that use the unloading response as well because we predict the, the permanent set much more accurately. Um, so to summarize, um, as, as no surprise probably, that's better to have more data than less. Uh, but you need to make sure that your data are relevant. And another thing that people don't always think about, you need to have balanced data. So you can't have um, too many tests of one kind and too few of, of another kind. In our example, we had seven relaxation uh, segments, and then we had two tension, monotonic tension tests. That's not really balanced. You may want to uh, change the, the fitness weights for some of those things um, in M calibration, if that's something you're concerned about. So, so back to our original question, is stress relaxation or cyclic loading better? Well, well, we need to remember that when I say cyclic loading here, I'm really talking about cyclic loading with relaxation segments in it, and I would actually prefer that still because it gives you the unloading response as well. So stress relaxation is fine. In some cases, it doesn't really matter if you have the unloading or not. It depends on your material model and if the material model is accurate enough to capture the difference between loading and unloading. Um, but if, if you want to be safe, I would certainly do this type of cyclic loading with stress relaxation segments in it. And that's kind of the recommendation I have. Um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Just head over to polymerfm.com and, and you can ask your questions there. Thank you.